There's still time, though, if you'd like to sign up for that. It is October 13th is the night we're going to do that, and we'll be out on the lawn. We'll have some games set up. Uh, the, we'll have some bluegrass music playing. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yep, and, uh, and uh, the McKeans are smoking uh, barbecue for us, and so it is going to be just a grand old time. So uh, make sure you've RSVP'd and plan to come join us October 13th out uh, front to enjoy fellowship together. Our prayer wall and prayer cards are also out in the lobby. Just a reminder that um, that is at your disposal and is easy for you to use. If you have a prayer uh, that you would like prayed for, but maybe you don't want to send it out in the email across the church, just uh, grab a card, put it on there, uh, clip it back to the wall, and someone, I'm sure, would love to come by and pray for you. The same if you would like to pray for someone, drop by the prayer card wall, um, pick up a card, put it on your dresser, on your nightstand, maybe uh, in your car with you, and so you can see it throughout the week and pray for uh, the things that are needed inside uh, and around our community at Evergreen Church. And lastly, Priscilla, Priscilla, oh, oh, there she is. I just missed her. Priscilla has an announcement for you all, and so I'm going to pass the mic over to her. Good morning, Evergreen. Oh, y'all woke this morning. Y'all look good, too. Um, as Jonathan said, I'm Priscilla Tennant. For those of you who don't know, I'm the Children's Ministry Coordinator here at Evergreen Church. Um, and I just wanted to stand before you and um, uh, give a call for more team members for our Thrive Ministry team. Um, we have a great team as is, but I just wanted to make a call to fill in some gaps. Um, for some once some volunteers who can come once a month i do have an awesome team who comes once a month to serve with our nursery and our preschool but we still need um like four or five people to come who are willing to serve at our 11 o'clock service especially we have a few more kids at that service um to serve in those areas and support our um team and staff also if you're willing to help us with check-in and check-in just involves you greet the people who come you help them sign in on our little tablet and then close the door after the kids come in and then when service is over just make sure it's open for the parents to come get their kids so if you're able to help in that capacity, that would be awesome. Um, if you are able to help us, and this is church-wide, if you are a youth, you are welcome to come. If you are a parent, you are able to come. If you are one of our senior members, um, join us. We would love to have you. Um, if you're able and interested, you can holler at me after the service or email me at that email address right there. Um, and just let me know how you are willing to help our team out and serve our families here and just support our children and becoming disciples of Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much.
morning, everyone. I'm so, I'm so glad to see everyone here today. Um, and thank you for the people joining us online. With all the distractions of the world, with the stress, anxiety, and worry which plague us, the call to worship invites us not to forget those things, but to reframe them, to put them in the context of our almighty God, who is victorious in Christ and is calling us into his kingdom. So this morning, if you are able, would you stand for the call to worship? I'll begin by saying, praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. He heals the broken heart and binds up their wounds. God determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain. God makes grass grow on the hills, providing food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. And truly, our opening hymn this morning goes with the final words of our call to worship. Praise the Lord. You know, in Psalm 126, it says, The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Our opening hymn this morning by a wonderful hymn writer, Fanny J. Crosby. Don's mentioned Fanny J. Crosby, I think, several times in introducing uh, our hymns. But... And we probably remember, Fanny J. Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns. Can you imagine? And Don, that's just under the name of Fanny J. Crosby. She had another name that she published under as well. But the interesting thing about Fanny J. Crosby was that at six weeks old, she was stricken with an eye infection and lost her sight. And we go and look through all of these wonderful hymns that Fanny J. Crosby wrote throughout her life hymns of praise and thanksgiving and giving God the glory, going through her life without the gift of sight. But she had a sight that went far beyond that of just seeing. And that was the ability, a gift of God, to write such hymns as our opening hymn this morning, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. She wrote this hymn and it was published in 1875, and it's become one of the great hymns of our faith. But you know, that was over in England. To God be the glory never appeared in the United States till 1954. Y'all remember this guy called Billy Graham? <laughs> Cliff Barrows was Billy Graham's song director. And then right before a... Billy Graham Crusade in Nashville, Tennessee, a friend of Cliff Barrow says, this is a hymn I came across while I was in England. I think you ought to take a look at it. Cliff Barrows took it and introduced to God be the glory in the 1954 Billy Graham Crusade. And since then, it's been one of our greatest hymns of faith here in the United States. Let's join together to God be the glory. Praise the Lord. 
as we come before the Lord to confess our sin and accept his forgiveness again, let us allow Psalm 34 to help us consider how we have sinned. This is what it says. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever you loves life and desires to see many good things, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Let's take a few moments of silence to consider how we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Holy God, we cannot begin to count, describe, or even understand the ways we have sinned. While we have accepted your grace, we have not lived graceful lives. While we have accepted your love, we have treated those around us harshly. While you have provided us generously, we have not been generous. Acknowledge our sin and the ways we continue to contribute to the sorrow and pain of this world. We ask you, for the sake of your son Jesus, and through the power of your Holy Spirit in us, to forgive us and make us new. Put new and right hearts in us, so that what we say is your word, and what we do is your work. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. People of the church, hear the good news of the gospel. The word of the Lord as it came to Ezekiel, promise the day when God will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In Christ, we see the fulfillment of God's promise because we, who were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. In Christ, our sins are forgiven, and a new day has come. Amen. You can go with Good morning. I guess I have to stay back here so I can get the people online too. Good morning. So, so I want to talk to you today about swimming lessons. Have you all had swimming lessons already? Right? You learn to swim by getting in the water and putting your face in, and maybe your swimming teacher yelled at you, kick, 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 kick your feet, right? When you're really little, that's what they yell to the little ones, kick, kick, and you have to learn how to pull the water with your arms, right? And, but there's another part of swimming lessons that I've been working on with my grandchildren and I've seen, and that's learning to roll over on your back and float. Did you all have to learn that as part of your swimming lessons too? Yeah, it's, it's really important, especially with a little child, with a little child, to teach them to roll over on their back and float. Why? Why do you think that is? What? Right, so that if they get scared in the water or their arms get tired and their feet get tired, they can roll over on their back and that way their nose is above the water and they can just float and the water will hold them up. And I was thinking about this, that this week when I was reading in my Bible in the Psalms where it says, 
be still and know that I am God. And I was thinking about how hard it is for my grandbabies to learn to be still. They don't want to. They are laying on their back and they just keep wanting to roll back over and kick their arms and move their arms because they're afraid. And they have to learn to trust the water and be calm so that they can get that rest. And I think it's the same way with us. We need to learn to be still and trust God when we're tired, when we feel afraid, when we get a cramp, something hurts us. We need to learn to be still before God. That means we stop doing work. That means we listen to God. And that means we trust that God's going to hold us even when we can't swim anymore, when, even when we can't do the work anymore. Okay? And then when we're refreshed, God will want us to turn back over and start doing the work again and swim again. But we need those times where we're still and trust that God is God. Okay? So let's pray. Lord, I ask you to help us to use each Sunday as a chance to be still and know that you're God. We don't have to do the work. We just have to trust that you're there, you're holding us. Help us to learn that. In Jesus' name, amen.
Like, there we go. <laughs> you know, I've told you before, and I'll tell you again the devil lives in the soundboard. <laughs> it does. We exercise it regularly, but it doesn't seem to always work. It just comes back. Well, I wanted to, uh, I mean, I know you noticed already, but aren't you glad to have John back? It's good, and um, Mary is making progress, and so we look forward to that as well. Um, the other thing that I will let you know is for those of you um, who know our elder John Snyder, who was injured in, um, by, when he got hit by a car when he was biking, um, he got home on Wednesday. Um, and so God keeps showing off, and it is a very, very good thing. Um, I will also let you know, and some of you who have been to these will be like, oh, it must have been terrible. We had a Presbytery meeting over the weekend, and I'm going to tell you, Presbytery meetings in our former denomination were not very much fun. Presbytery meetings in our current denomination are awesome, because it is a group of people who love the Lord and who are doing their level best to help each other take the gospel out to the world. People are struggling, um, and, and I, I will tell you, I mean, COVID is still a thing, and people are still trying to get people back, but do you know how grateful I am to see each one of you every Sunday? It's a big deal, and I know some of you are still home, and I understand that, but I'm just going to encourage you, when you're ready, come back. I mean, even if it's to a Wednesday night that's outside, if COVID's what's keeping you away, we're, we're trying to make opportunities for people to connect because, honestly, connection is part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's very, very difficult to follow Christ virtually. I mean, I, I know that, that certainly you can be faithful and be, be distant, but, but at the same time, fellowship and loving each other is hard to do over a, a computer screen. So I, I just want to encourage you, if you are home, we're glad that you're connecting with us, but we would love to see you back here the minute you're ready. Some of you, I, you know, I don't see you every week, and I get that. I totally understand. People have been off doing things. Did any, have any of you been to any college football games lately? You have. It's amazing. They turn COVID off for football games. I don't know how they do that. It's just amazing. And my team won last night. I didn't see it because it started at like the middle of the night, but because um, I, I had to come to work in the morning. But somehow we pulled it out again. And so I was going to say all God's people, but it'll be only the Auburn people, War Eagle. So... So last week, um, we stepped into the sermon Jesus is preaching on the, the side of the mountain, um, the Sermon on the Mount. He's preaching to his disciples who have come, um, his disciples who are following him, to people who have come to find healing. And we heard Jesus say in that passage, that part of the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up treasure on earth, but store up treasure in heaven. Now, that section of Scripture ends with this admonishment 
You cannot serve two masters because you will love the one and hate the other, or you will despise the one and be devoted to the other. You cannot serve God and money. And that's really where I want to begin this morning. I want to begin there because the passage we have for today begins with the word, therefore. And so we know that what's coming is built on what came before. Now, some of what is here in this passage is obvious. You've been around a church a time or two. You may have heard preaching on this, and the point that is usually made is you can't have two gods, right? I mean, sometimes, and sometimes we treat God, treat money like a god, and that's absolutely true. When we allow money to tell us who we are, if we allow our surplus of funds or our lack of funds to write the story that we are living now and in the future, if we're looking to money for security and we invest all of our time and our energy in taking care of it, we literally become a slave to it, then we're treating money like a god, and we might have an idolatry problem. Now, this doesn't mean that money is bad. It just means that money is a caution because money easily slides into idolatry when we're not looking. Now, we can say a lot about that previous passage, and I already did last week, and I'm not going to go back through that, but I I want to make sure that you don't miss the idolatry part. This question of who or what do you really trust? Trusting God is essential to living in the kingdom of heaven. And that is what Jesus is describing to all the people who were gathered hearing him preach. He is describing the kingdom of heaven, and he is helping them understand how to live into this kingdom now. And assuming that that we are moving in the right direction, that we're aligning our hearts to trust God, the therefore that we're about to encounter is going to make sense. But let's pray together before we get there. God, we're so grateful for the way that you keep showing up in these really incredible ways. We are grateful for the gifts that you give us, gifts of your presence and everything that we have this morning. We offer to you because you are worthy. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. I am in the Gospel of Matthew. I'm in the sixth chapter. I'm going to begin reading in verse 25, and I'm going to read down through the end of the chapter, which is verse 34. Listen to the word of the Lord. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore... Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Therefore, do not worry. Easy to say, hard or do. Even when you trust God, worry can show up. Without even noticing it, we're fixing things in our head. We're strategizing things. We're overthinking everything. Now, Jesus limits do not worry to three things. Well, it depends on how you count, but food, drink, and clothing. My list is bigger. Yours too? 
Even when you've sat in church your whole life, attended Sunday school, gone to retreats, even though you're working to align your heart to trust in God more every day, even when you are convinced that the kingdom of heaven is here with you and in you, worry can still haunt us like a plague. And I want to be careful here because statistically there are people in this room who suffer from anxiety disorders. More than 40 million people in the United States do, just in the U.S. And so I don't want to give the impression that anxiety is a sin. We need to compassionately know that for some people, anxiety isn't something that they choose. I mean, especially if you've been through some kind of trauma, you might now find that your body just reacts to normal, everyday stress with this, this, this anxiety that's more of a, a habit than it is a choice. I mean, people will try to talk you out of it. Oh, you're overthinking this. You're, it's not that bad. You're, you're making a big deal out of it. But you see, with this kind of thing, it's, facts aren't the problem, right? For those of us who, who have anxiety, maybe even especially for those of us, for those who, for whom worry is a habit, which for a lot of people it is, this passage has something important to say to us. And the first thing that it says is, well, the way I read it at least, worry is an opportunity to seek the kingdom of heaven. Worry is an opportunity to seek the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever thought about that? I think it's true. I mean, most of the time, if we're followers of Christ, right, if we're trying to represent Jesus in our workplace or in our families, in our neighborhoods, wherever God has called us to be his ambassadors, when we catch ourselves worrying, we tend to be pretty harsh with ourselves about it. We'll slap ourselves around and say, well, this isn't faithful. This isn't a faithful response to this. I mean, and so we just kind of like beat ourselves up. Well, two things happen when we deny our worry. That kind of denial can lead us to like shoving our, our worry down into our left shoe, right? Do you know what I mean? So nobody sees what's actually going on. And somehow we've decided that pretending that we're not worried is more holy than revealing our true feelings. And yes, we know from experience and from what Jesus says, worrying isn't useful or productive. I mean, Jesus says that, right? He says, who of, you can, who of you by worrying can add an hour to your life, right? Well, here's the really interesting thing about that translation is the actual translation of that passage is this, because I think Jesus is kind of doing this to us. The actual translation of that is, who of you by worrying can make yourself a cubit taller? How, who here can make themselves taller by worrying about it? I mean, that's just a silliness, right? And I think that's what Jesus is sort of trying to say is, well, this isn't the most productive thing, but pretending that we aren't worried when we are can just lead to shame and guilt. And potentially, it can lead us to what Jesus has been speaking against for a lot of the Sermon on the Mount, being a hypocrite, acting one way when the truth actually lies somewhere else. But denial of worry also has a tendency to shut us out of community. Because here's the thing, if I'm just pretending that I'm not worried, then I'm also denying you the opportunity to walk with me, to pray with me, to encourage me. We're actually breaking the body. And and beyond that, when, when we say to people who may or may not be Christians, or maybe it is to other Christians, when we, when we say to them what we say to ourselves, when we worry, oh, that's not faithful, you shouldn't do that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. if I say that to you, then what am I actually saying to you? I don't want any part of this. You're doing it wrong. See, I think, really, worry is a, is a training tool. Every time we feel that worry start to well up in us, that anxiety begin to rise, God is giving us this this opportunity to consider anew the kingdom of heaven. And if you haven't heard me say this before, hear me now, the kingdom of heaven is not up somewhere in the clouds. It is a present but yet unfulfilled reality in the world right here and right now. 
It's here in this place by the Spirit of God. And the kingdom is, is the world as God created it. It's this world completely renewed, a world where worry would actually, well, it would be completely unnecessary and frankly almost impossible because the kingdom of heaven, if we were living there like in ourselves, well, to use the words of Paul, we would be fully known just as we have been fully known. And, and what I mean by that is 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 that in the kingdom, we never have to guess if what's coming tomorrow or later today or in the next 15 minutes is going to be good. It might be hard. It might be complicated. But we know it will be good because the king who is in control of it all is good. And so worry actually invites us to renew our confidence in God every time we feel it come on us. It invites us to walk with other people who are experiencing worry or anxiety the same way. It's not to dismiss it. It's to actually walk into it with them. Worry is an opening to praying to God. And Jesus has some other ideas in this passage about how to deal with worry. Jesus says, when you are worried, consider for a second how valuable you are to God. Jesus compares us to the birds of the air. Look at them, he says. I mean, they're not running around planning on how to have enough. They're not strategizing. They're not storing up treasures on earth in bones. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than the birds? Now, the question sort of answers itself, doesn't it? And it leads to this, confu- this conclusion which says, look, if God takes care of the birds, then, then God is going to take care of you, which is not to make less of the birds, but it is to make more of you. And it's amazing to me how many people will walk through the world feeling unworthy of God's basic provision but we will still claim the cross, we'll still claim the resurrection, we'll claim and be confident in eternal life, and yet we're not sure that God's going to provide for us today. And we watch the birds in the trees or the squirrels running around our yards. I have a thousand squirrels in my yard. And we understand and, and actually give very little thought to, will God make sure they have what they need? Yet somehow... We are not sure he'll do the same for us. And yet Jesus says, you are so much more valuable. So trust. Trust in the value that God puts on you. Along the same lines, did you notice the reference in here to your heavenly Father? It actually comes up twice. Once when Jesus says your heavenly Father feeds the birds, and again further in where Jesus says your heavenly Father knows what you need. Um, there's a guy who would say that's like a hyperlink, right? There should be like, it should be in blue, and if you click on it, it should take you someplace else. Well, these actually point us back to the beginning of chapter 6, to the Lord's Prayer. This is what, Je- what Jesus says there. He basically repeats here, do not be like the pagans because... Your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And so that's the next thing to sort of tuck into your pocket, right, for a worry-filled day. God already knows what you need. Such an important thing to know and to live out of when you're trying to live in the kingdom, isn't it? I mean, sometimes when we're worried, we start praying as if God doesn't know, that God isn't present, that God's not paying attention, that, that somehow what we're putting in front of God is all new to him. I mean, hey God, are, are you aware that this is what I need? It's like we're trying to inform him or manipulate him or trying to get God to pay attention to us. But we've missed the point. He already knows what we need. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't pray. We do. But it changes the way we pray. Do you see that? Because there is a way of praying which is pleading and begging, and then there is a way of praying that is vastly different than that. 
I mean, have you ever had a season in your life when you're worried that you're not praying right because life is hard and complicated? Maybe I'm the only one here that's ever happened to. But surely, all of these things that are happening, all of this difficulty that I'm going through is because I'm doing something wrong. And so what I end up doing is adding to this hard struggle that I'm already going through the knowledge or belief, at least, that I'm doing something wrong and I'm adding to this. I'm actually causing it. Well, there's all kinds of arrogance involved in that, A. But B, it's not true. And when I look at this passage, I can take a breath and know, no, no, God is already with me. This isn't about me praying wrong or not holding my mouth right or not standing on one foot on a Tuesday when there's a full moon. No, I can take a breath and I can relax. God is already with me. He knows. I can, to use Pat's great analogy, I can flip over on my back and float. It's not about praying right. It's about knowing that God has got me and that God is good. It completely changes the way I pray. Finally, Jesus tells us, look, if you're worried, change your perspective. And I think that's what he means when he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness, and all these things are going to be given to you as well. Jesus sets up this contrast between what the pagans are doing. They're chasing after food, drink, clothing, and what kingdom people are doing, seeking after the kingdom. Now, for me, when we understand what the kingdom of heaven is, the contrast is between sort of frantic grabbing and peaceful receiving. It's the difference between having a business relationship with the owner and being an heir of the estate. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't work. Some people actually read this passage that way, that you should just sit around and wait for God to show up and drop things in your lap. God is gracious, and God is abundant, and God is going to provide, but God also designed us to work. We are happiest when we are productive. If you look back to Genesis, you will see Adam's function is to what? Work the garden that God has created back in perfection. So just as knowing you are part of the family changes the way that you pray, knowing you are part of the family changes the way you work. I mean, if you are working in order to ensure that you are being taken care of, that kind of work is, is frantic, it's, it's tentative, it leads to heart sickness, panic, distrust, misplaced reliance on money. But work that is done knowing that you're part of the family and you're already taken care of, that your needs are already covered, that, that comes out of a confidence. It, it, it's, that kind of work is creative and beautiful and fulfilling. And it, sure, it might produce income, but it is so focused on the goodness and the provision that even though the work might be hard, it brings peace. And then Jesus ends this passage with another therefore. Based on everything that has come before, therefore, because you are living into the kingdom of heaven that I have started, therefore, do not worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Every time I read this, it reminds me of Sylvia. When I was a young attorney in Florida, Marianne and I invited the office manager of the firm that I worked for over for dinner. Her name was Ruth. Now, I'm pretty sure that our oldest had been born at that point. She might have been 18 months. And at first, Ruth declined our invitation because her mother lived with her, and she didn't want to leave her home alone. I understood. And her mom was like in her late 80s. So, of course, we said, well, just bring her with you. And to our delight, she did. When Ruth arrived, she introduced us to her mom, Sylvia. Sylvia talked like this. She sounded like she had smoked for a hundred years. She had this very Yiddish way of speaking. I am confident she grew up in one of the boroughs of New York. After she came in and she was seated as a good host, I asked her, Sylvia, can I get you something to drink? Some wine, some water? She said, no, darling, wine makes me dizzy. I said, can I get you something else? Two fingers of scotch, no ice. 
I was a little shocked. She also asked for an ashtray for the cigarette she had just lit up. So, I tell you all of that to set the stage for a moment which happened later. Marianne and I were talking about our daughter, something about the future. And Sylvia stopped us, and she said, Darlings, don't borrow trouble. I'd never heard that before. And she said, look, every day has enough trouble of its own. Why borrow from tomorrow into today? Really close, isn't it? I mean, religiously, Sylvia was not a Christian. She was Jewish, but after her 80-odd years on this earth, she knew the truth of what Jesus said. And what she said has followed me forever. Darling, don't borrow trouble. Whenever I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, when I don't know how I'm going to get through the next 15 minutes, when I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm taking three facts and extrapolating them into a future outcome, I hear her voice. Darling, don't borrow trouble. Or is it really Jesus' voice in the person of Sylvia in a very Yiddish way, saying, you are valuable. Your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask. Chase after the kingdom, and everything else will be just fine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. If you have... Um, not been with us for communion before. Um, Today is a communion Sunday. We celebrate communion once a month. And um, there are communion elements in the back. If you would prefer that, if you don't want to come forward, and I understand because of um, COVID that you might not want to, there are gluten-free elements in the back. There are gluten-free elements up here um, as well. If you are home, um, if you are online, um, now would be the time to go to get your elements. But I think it's a It's an appropriate thing, right, to come to the table on a Sunday where Jesus is talking about worry. Because this really, ultimately, is the place where we understand what God is willing to do for us. I mean, completely give himself away for us. Not because we were good, not because we were smart, not because we had a plan, not because we stored stuff away in barns, not because we got an A on the test. Simply because he loves us and cares for us. That's an incredibly important thing to know and to live out of. It is really the foundation of the kingdom of heaven. You can't get to the kingdom of heaven without the cross. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus, on the night before he was arrested, tried, and put on a cross, he was in an upper room with his disciples, his friends. And there, after giving thanks, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body. It's given for you. Take, eat, all of you. And when you do so, remember. Remember me. Remember what God is willing to give. In a like manner, Jesus poured the cup and he said this new cup is the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. That covenant is sealed in my blood. Every time we eat the bread, every time we drink the cup, we proclaim and show forth the saving death of our risen Lord until the day he returns. These are God's gifts. They are for us. God's people. This morning I want to do something just a little bit different, and kids are on their way in, and that's great. I want to start with the Apostles' Creed, and so if you would stand and join me in this ancient statement of faith, Christians, as you come to the table, as you consider the kingdom of heaven, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask the servers if they would come forward. And as they come forward, I want to pray. Let's pray together. Holy God, we come to this table humbly. For we did not set it. We have simply been invited. And so as we take this bread and this cup, may it be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And may we understand that the Lord, You have given all for us. And while we might worry about tomorrow, while we might worry about what comes next, convince us again, You have a plan that is bigger and better than anything we could imagine. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. A little instruction for you if you are coming forward for um, communion this morning. Uh, we will break off a piece of the bread and hand it to you. And then you will dip it in the cup. If you would like to, if you're going to take communion elements that you've already picked up in the back, you may open those and take those as you like. And also there are gluten-free elements. If you'll just let one of us know, we'd be happy to make sure that you are served with those.
Friends, therefore do not worry. Easy to say, harder to do. But go out into this world knowing how much God loves you. Live out of God's huge plan for you. And occasionally, learn to roll over and float on your back. Be still. Know He is God. You're going to run into somebody this week who is struggling through something, who is worried beyond belief. Accept their worry. Walk with them. Don't tell them it's wrong, but tell them that God's got a plan and that they're not alone because they're not. God loves you. Go love your neighbors. Serve the Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and in you, both now and forever. Amen. And if you would please be seated for the postlude.